Welcome, my name is Rachel. I'm so glad that you're here with us today at the SCC online campus. We have an incredible message for you today. Let's join in. If I was going to title this just with a one-off title, uh, the title for today would be How to Follow Jesus. Uh, this is what I hope, this is a, a kind of a, a practical application teach because I know there's sometimes where I come in and, and I, I hoop, I shout, I spit all over the front two rows uh, and, and you know, just do you know, my, my you know, spiritual aerobics, right? Minus the spandex, because that would be weird. Um, but we get in here and you're all, you're all fired up. Some of you are like, man, that was a really weird statement. It's okay, we can edit that out. I think sometimes we walk out of a church moment, we're like, man, we had good church. And we're like, yeah, well, what did you learn? You're like, "Ah, I don't know, but man, the the music sure was good today. And so today, I I really hope that you hear my heart that this is is an application message. This is a how-to message because uh, it's not just about the gathering. Just hear me, it is about the going. But I think sometimes we don't understand how to go. And I think sometimes we don't understand what it really means to follow Jesus. And so we're looking at a passage of scripture that uh, is in uh, the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They are in sync with one another, but is also spoken about in the gospel of John, which is a love letter to all humanity. This is, if you've been in, in church for a while, this is, uh, it's called, uh, you know, the, the transfiguration. You're like, oh, that's great. I have no idea what that means. We're going to look at that because it's not just a story about Jesus. There's application through his disciples that, that we can look at. And so um, I, I want to jump right into it. Uh, this is again, this is an important moment in the ministry and life of Jesus, but it's an important moment for how the disciples then operated going forward because they tell us and show us what to do, but also what not to do. And so we are in Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 2, and we're going to be reading through 13. Uh, The Bible says, and after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, he took James, and he took John, and he led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them, Peter, James, and John, Elijah with Moses, and they, Elijah and Moses, were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Verse six says, for he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. Next verse says, and a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them, but Jesus only. Uh, And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. And they asked him, why did the scribes say that first Elijah must come? And he said to them, Elijah does come first to restore all things. And how is it written of the the Son of Man that he should be Uh, that he should suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did to him him whatever they pleased, as it is written of him. Again, this is... This is a message, a a story that is seen in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We don't see it played out in the Gospel of John. We see the understanding of it in John 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But here's where it actually points out uh, in the Gospel of John uh, uh, that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten Son of God. So it's in this, it's, it's an important moment that, that, that something is happening in the ministry and in the person of Jesus, but also in the lives of the disciples. Hear me and hear me clearly. We live a short-sighted life. We live a life where we are just, uh, we're, we're targeting what is going to happen and be accomplished between 70 to 80 years while we're here. If, if you really think about it, We don't live life with eternity in mind necessarily. 
We don't live life where we are, everything that we are doing is for where we are going. We try to amass, we try to accumulate, we try to acquire everything that we can for the 70 to 80 years here on earth. If salvation is just about heaven, then let's just eat all the donuts and cake we can, all the little Debbie oatmeal cream pies that we can, and let's hurry this joker up so that we we get there. The problem is, is that we are called to implement on earth eternity as it is in heaven. We're called to bring into this, we're called to bring the infinite into the finite. We're called to bring what is actually real. This, hear me, is just a dream. People that have these near-death experiences they, they have these near-death experiences where they're, they're encountering Jesus and they're encountering heaven and then come back to here and feel like this is a dream. But we are so short-sighted and we put all the focus in on this moment. And here's what Peter, here's what James, here's what John encounter. In this moment, they see the other, listen, they see the other side of the veil. They see Jesus transfigured. It means transformed. And he takes on his heavenly appearance, his heavenly appearance. Here's what Matthew 17 says, that he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. Not just that his clothes became white, but his being became so bright. His being was like the sun. This is giving the understanding of what 1 John 1.15 says, that this is the message we've heard from him and declared to you that God is light. When Moses goes up on the mountain, he goes up for 40 days and he has this moment where he's encountering God and he's saying, God, show me your glory. I want to see you face to face. And God's response is, no man can see me and live. But here's what I'll do, Moses. I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. I'll put you in the corner with your back to me and I will allow all my goodness to pass in front of you and you can see me from behind because if you see me in all my goodness, if you see me in all my glory, you your, your uh, unholiness will be consumed. Your, your wretchedness will be consumed because I am so, your, your finite being cannot handle my infiniteness. And so this is what happens. But think about it. What did Israel at the base of the mountain see? They saw this dark cloud cover the top of the mountain. They, they saw flashes of lightning. They, they heard peals of thunder. It's, it's Psalms 18, uh, 18, 11. It says that he made darkness his covering. They are on the ground and they, they can't see the light because he has such a covering around the mountain because it would consume them too. Jesus in this moment is allowing Peter, James, and John to see his heavenly form, to see what he will look like. He's currently seated at the right hand of the Father, interceding on your behalf and on mine, but he is in now a glorified body where he is waiting for us to get there, where we will shed these bodies that are mortal because we will live forever somewhere. Amen. We were built to live forever. And what Peter, James, and John, they are encountering this. They are seeing this other side of eternity. What looks and resembles Revelation 21, 33, that in the new city, there is no need of a sun or a moon because God is the light of that city. They're encountering, why? They're, they're watching Jesus have conversations with people that have stepped into eternity. Moses and Elijah. They are witnesses on this side. The veil is removed so they can see into what is actually more real than what we are encountering right now. And they see him in his glorified body, meeting with the saints who are still waiting and anticipating where we will meet them together. Hear me. They're encountering this, yes? And here's what Peter does. Peter does exactly 
what we do. We don't know how to handle moments like this. And so we go to default mode where we need to feel like we have to start doing stuff. Peter is meeting, right? He's James, John, Peter, he's meeting. He's seeing Jesus having this encounter. And what does he do? Rabbi, Jesus, it sure is good that we're here. <laughs> let's, uh, let's, 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 let's make three tents. One for you, Moses, and Elijah. What does that have to do with anything? He's only, ta- you ever just like start talking because talking you're nervous? And you're like, I don't, I don't even know what to say, so I'm just gonna like, uh, hi. You know, it just, it's so awkward, right? That's what Peter's doing this. We know this because the next verse says, for Peter started talking because they were terrified. Peter's like, I don't, I don't know what to say. I I'm not quite sure what should go on. So I'm going to go to default mode and I'm going to start trying to do stuff. We encounter Jesus, we say yes to Jesus, we're on this journey with Jesus, and because we don't know what we really, what really should be going on, we think we need to start doing stuff for Jesus and doing stuff for God. And God has to come down and says, hey, Peter, shut your pie hole. <laughs> stop, stop trying to do What does he say? Listen to him. This is my beloved son. Listen to him. We get so focused in as we are following Jesus. We don't really know how to follow Jesus. So we try to prove our worth. We try to prove our value. We we try to do good things. We try to not mess up. We, We just go into this posture of doing because if we, will, uh, if we will do good, then it means that we will be good. And that's not how this works. This is a relationship. What Peter is missing is, is that my being with God should be higher priority than my doing for God. Peter is totally missing it. He's like, I'm encountering this and I don't, I don't know what, what should happen right now, so let me just start doing stuff instead of, Sit, just be, just understand he's God, he's good. And Peter, he invited you into this moment so that you could see something, but you've become so busy attempting to do, you're missing out on what they're talking about. You're missing out. Jesus is having a conversation with people that have been gone for thousands of years. And Peter is so like, I gotta do something. We got, guys, we gotta do something that they miss out and we don't even re- realize or understand what Peter, Moses, and I'm sorry, what Jesus, Moses, and Elijah were even saying to one another. We, we, we miss out because Peter got so focused in on doing instead of being. Watch this. Uh, 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 following Jesus is following the pattern of his relationship with God. Jesus, Jesus tells us, he says, I don't do anything except what I hear the Father doing, what I, what I hear the Father saying, and what I see the Father doing. I don't, there is, no, I never step out of turn, I never step, watch, Jesus is saying, I am going to be with the Father, and I will only do what I see him doing. I will only say what I hear him saying. I'm not going to be busy trying to prove, hey, work through me, hey, be with me, hey, like, I'm just going to be with him and let him then work through me. Watch, we have to, uh, the focus of my follow is not burning bushes and monumental mountain moments. The focus of my follow with Jesus is not this ESPN top 10 highlight reel of all these cool things. The focus of my follow with Jesus is to see in Jesus the pattern of the relationship with the Father. That is how we implement on earth as it is in heaven. 
That is how we see miracle signs and wonders happen. Not because we are producing them, but because we are being with the Father that as we are going along our way, He brings things in our path that we can then lean into Him and know how to handle. So here's where we are. We need to understand how to follow Jesus. That's what we're talking about this morning, how to follow Jesus. I got three, three things that I can outline of how to follow Jesus. Write them down, this will help. Uh, if you write it on your neighbor's arm, uh, it'll help you and them both remember. If this is your first time hearing me say that, that's funny to you. If you've been here for now three plus years, you're like, when is he gonna get a new joke? <laughs> I love to beat a dead horse. It's just, I'm not letting go of that one. It's funny to me every single time. Um, how to follow Jesus. First things I need to do, I need to identify how important his words are to me. How to follow Jesus. I have to identify how important his words are to me. Watch this. Uh, you realize that every time Jesus was tempted, he used the word to combat the situation. First of all, let's not glaze over the fact that Jesus was tempted. Can we just, can we just bring that up? Can we not just like, I know, blonde haired, blue eyed American Jesus who like, you know, when he moves, like his feet doesn't even move. He just kind of like floats around, right? First of all, he wasn't blonde haired and blue eyed. Jesus was tempted in all like manner as we were. He encountered fear. He encountered worry. He encountered anxiety. He, all temptations that we encounter, he encountered but he handled them with the word. That's the remarkable difference. And because he handled them with the word, he overcame every single temptation. Here, here's what we see in Psalms 119, 11. Your word, O Lord, have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. That Psalms 1, uh, uh, 119, verse 11. Your word have I hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. This is how Jesus operates on earth. He has the word hidden on the inside of him that when it looks like he's going to make a step, to sin means to miss the mark. When Jesus is in Encountering a situation where in his flesh he might miss the mark, he leans back on the word that is resident on the inside of him. And that keeps him from taking a stray step. That's how he lived a sinless and spotless life. The word has to matter to us. What the Bible says in Revelations, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. It's not the word of my testimony. It's repeating what he's already said about my situation and reminding him of it. And that's how I overcome in my situation. Uh, Chris Cornell called me 12, 12 months ago. He said, hey, I'm at the hospital with Stephanie. She's got this unique, weird pain, and, and we don't know what to do. And I'm like, man, what scripture are you standing on? I don't know. I was like, well, look, I'll pray with you, and we're going to pray the word. And I, I started praying, God, uh, we declare healing to her body. We declare, Jesus, that it is by your stripes that she is healed. We speak wisdom and counsel to every nurse, doctor, and attending physician. All I'm doing is praying the word. I don't have what it takes to fix anybody's situation, much less my own. I just know how to get to the word. When we get done praying, all of a sudden, 10 to 15 minutes later, Stephanie's pain-free. That's awesome. Except it happened 12 months later, just a few weeks ago. But instead of Chris calling me, Chris says, Stephanie, what would Pastor Nathan tell us to do? He'd tell us to get a word and start praying it. Get a word and start standing on it. You realize that when Peter got out of the boat, he wasn't stepping on water. He was stepping on the word. Lord, if that's you, bid me come. Come on. And so... Chris starts praying the word, watch, over his wife. Guess what happens? 10 to 15 minutes later, the pain is gone. Why? Because he is utilizing the word to work. For, the word will work if you work it. The word will show up every single time. Nathan, are you telling me that miracles happen? Absolutely. When you stand on the word, you lean into the power resonant in what God has already said. I'm just, God, I'm just going to remind you of what you said about my situation. It's not my job 
job to make it happen. It's my job to lean on the word. Here's the question I asked my, my group at, at Guys Night on this past Thursday. I said, what's your life scripture? What's the scripture that, Nathan, what's the scripture when you're getting hit with crippling anxiety, when you're getting overwhelmed with fear? Nathan, what is the scripture that you are holding on to when you have nothing else to hold on to? What, what is the scripture that when you need to pray for sickness and you're getting hit with, God, how are you gonna pay this bill and how is this gonna handle? What, what is the life scripture? Mine is Psalms 46.1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble. He is, he is my shelter. He is where I make my homestead. He is, where I, uh, he is where when the storm is raging around me, I can go into my refuge and I can find quiet, peace, and solace there. He is my strength. He's my security. He's a very present help. He is a proven help in my time of trouble. My question to you is what is the life scripture that you have? This is very practical. What is the life scripture that you have that you're standing on for whatever the situation is that comes your way? Because maybe I won't be there to answer the text or pick up the phone. You have to have your own scripture and you have to learn to stand on the word Maybe there won't be a, a, a care pastor around. Maybe there won't be a friend to pick up the phone. What is the word you are standing on? Does that make sense, church? Second thing, how to follow Jesus? We have to make time to commune with the Father. Jesus was constantly leaving the noise and the busyness of his surroundings to make time to commune with the Father. You realize that, like, we're all busy. I get it. You realize the, the, the high percentage of your life and your schedule that is nonsensical busyness? You, if you have social media, you doom scroll just as much as the next person. You, we waste time and they're like, oh, I, don't, I don't have any time. Jesus, made, Jesus left the crowds to go commune. To commune, it means to, to share one's intimate thoughts or feelings with someone. Jesus would steal away time from everything else that was inconsequential. Watch me. He would steal away time from everything else to go spend time with the Father. What was he doing in this like communing moment? Praying. Prayer is nothing more than conversation. Prayer is nothing more than just, hey God, here I am, and this is what it's got. like. I know, some people are like, well Nathan, I don't pray as good as you. Okay, can, can we talk about this? Give me, give me like 30 seconds on this. Anna's learning how to talk, our, our 11 month old. We're having her birthday today because we don't wanna have her birthday. It's five days after Opie's evicted on October 2nd at 1.30. <laughs> He's gonna come out and I'm like, I gotta start looking for a job for him. He's gotta start helping pay the bills. <laughs> You're not gonna be a squatter in this house. We're Pearsons, we're hard headed and we work hard. You know, Anna, she said, she, she's doing three things to communicate. She's saying mama, she's saying, she's saying dada, which is the most important. And she's pointing with her middle finger. She's pointing. I find it humorous. My wife does not. I'm like, where's mama? <laughs> now, some of you are really bothered that I'm using that as a joke. I'm sorry. Uh, here's what the Bible says. It's, uh, uh, I can, well, never mind. We're gonna keep going on. Some people are like, what am I talking about? That's, she's communicating. She's communicating, okay? You don't have to communicate like the person next to you. How do you communicate? How do you talk? When I, when I ask you, hey, do you wanna pray? And you're like, oh, I can't pray. You can't talk? You can't talk? Prayer is a conversation. It's, hey God, here I am. Here's what I'm dealing with. I need some help. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I'm worried. 
right? That's, uh, that's what it is. Prayer is just a conversation. And, here, and, and to be a, here's, what, here's what Martin Luther said. To be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. It, I'm not talking about, prayer is not a lifeline. It's a lifestyle. And how, how will I hear the heart of the Father if I am never talking with him? If I'm never in my conversation, God, I'm frustrated, I'm angry, I don't know how this is working out. How do I ever give him the opportunity to be invited into my moment? I have to, I have to find the moment where I just bring him in or else I am being beaten and battered by the waves by myself. No wonder I feel overwhelmed. Maybe it's I'm not, I say I'm a, a follower of Christ, but I'm not really following him because followers of Christ, hear me, they, they identify how important his words are, but they also make time to commune with the Father. Hear me, last thing right here. How to follow Jesus, I pour into others. I'm following Jesus when I'm pouring into others. We think it's about the gathering. This is where we get bandaged up because there's a lot of us in the room that yes are hurting and yes are wounded. This is where we get fired up. Where we get so filled with faith that we feel like we can go out and take on hell with a squirt gun. That we're so, our courage is built up to, to go out into the highways and go out in the byways and find the lost, the hurting, and the broken. This is where, this is where we do that. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that if all we're doing is taking in, when are we ever going to start pouring out? Here, Matthew 28. Here's what I love. Jesus says, go make disciples. When I was in Bible college, some very interesting things. They said, you never use bathroom humor from the platform. You never use crass verbiage. You never talk about, you know, babies, you know, pointing with their middle finger. And by the way, the Bible says to the pure, all things are pure. So if you're bothered that I use that, look at the New Testament. Our job is to go make disciples. It's not, tell your story, but that's drive-by evangelism. Who are you intentionally? Who are you uh, interpersonally? Who are you uh, uh, investing into? Invite them to church, yes, part of it. But who have you said, God, that person's got a target on them and I want to win them to you. Does, if I'm a follower of Christ, we, we have the antidote for what ails all of humanity. And we hide the cure for all of humanity by not even sharing the love that we found, the, the hope that we found, the peace that we found the comfort that we found, the healing that we found. You ha it's not my job to get your family and your loved ones saved. It's my job to get you ready to go disciple them. Who are you pouring into? Who are you pouring into? Do the people on your job know that you're a Christian? Do your neighbors know that you're a follower of Jesus? Not because you put out a Easter, Jesus is the reason for the season or whatever yard sign, I don't know. It's great. Have you talked and shared with them the love of Jesus? That's what a follower of Christ does. And I'm afraid we, we understand the gathering. I'm afraid we understand, yeah, just, you know, this is where I go to church. I'm a member here, I serve on the weekends. It's about the going. Who am I pouring into? Some people are like, I use this example. I love how my sister, this is my sister Debbie. I love how, uh, I love how she plays the piano. And sometimes we say things like, man, I wish I could play the piano like that. But how much have we actually practiced? 
You know what I mean? Man, I, I wish I could play the piano like you. Well, do you have a piano at home? Well, no. I wish I played the piano like that. Well, do you come to the church and practice? No. So we really don't mean that we want to, we really don't mean that we want to do that. It's similar when we say, man, I wish I could share the gospel like you. I wish I could share, I wish I could talk to people like Jesus, about Jesus like you. Here, here's a great thing. You play like you practice and you practice how you play. Man, I wish I could, I wish I could pray like that. Are you practicing? I wish I could share the gospel like that and pour into others. Are you practicing? Well, I don't want to mess up. Man, come on. You, you think that God is really going to be upset if you just be like, if you go up to some random person and you're like, hey, can I tell you about Jesus? And God's going to be disappointed if you're like, John 3, 15 says. Some of y'all got that. Man, just go share your story about how you encountered Jesus. God's plan for humanity is the local church. That is not this building. It's pretty. This is a pretty building, but God's plan for humanity is the local church. It's not this building, it's you. That's his plan for humanity, that the local church would go out into the highways and byways and encounter the hurting and broken and bring them there in that moment, the love of Christ. I think we got a lot of people that say we're following Jesus, but what we're actually doing is more like Peter. We have church and we encounter something, and so we think we need to do. And we don't realize that our following him is about being with him, about being in his presence and listening to what he has to say. And that happens through the word. That happens through communing with the Father in prayer. And that happens that out of those moments right there, we go then pour into somebody else. Does that make sense, church? I know this is a message I, I stepped on people's toes. It's good for you, it builds character. You, you need it, so do I. We need to be challenged. Go share the love of Jesus, because that's what a follower of Jesus does. Make it a point to get intentional about praying because that's what a follower of Jesus does. Make it a point, hear me, to get immersed in his word because that's what a follower of Jesus does. So glad you decided to join us today. At Salem, we are intent on creating community centered on Christ. The best way to connect in our community is using the digital connect card where you can ask questions or get info on anything going on at Salem. If for whatever reason you can't be here with us in person next week, we will see you right here on our online campus.